here. Someone will find you one. I see people scurrying over there. You'll have one. There's no, there's no microphone up here. Pardon? Oh, open up the top. Uh oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Not easily accessible. Okay. You're going to have to figure out how to turn it on because I'm lacking fingernails. Okay, so now that we're all uh, squared away, good morning and welcome to worship this third Sunday in Lent. We're glad you're here, and if you're a guest today, we want you to know that you're welcome at communion. We'll give instructions later. Throughout the liturgy, there are instructions to stand up and sit down, and if that's not comfortable for you and you'd prefer to keep sitting, just ignore that. It's fine for you to do whatever's comfortable. Midweek Wednesdays in Lent, uh, we are having hold an evening prayer at four, followed by a soup supper and study of the ELCA draft statement, Civic Life and Faith. And uh, we would love to have your voice be part of that and hope you'll join us. Um, health and wellness will be taking blood pressures immediately after worship in the choir room. And... At 11 o'clock, I'll present Where Do We Go for here, From Here, a transition overview and update in the last classroom on the left. So you go out this way, turn right at the office, all the way down to the end of the hall on the left. Um, we ask that you please check the back of the bulletin and the weekly newsletter for other announcements because we don't want to stand up here and read them all to you. There are other announcements. Sharon? Okay. As Pastor said, blood pressure's after church. So please come, sign in. Happy to do that for you. Um, next Sunday on the 10th is the End of Life Ready presentation. It's given by End of Life Ready Washington. And they'll be going over what paperwork do you need to fill out, what you need to talk to your doctor about to make plans, um, things like that. So love to have you. That's going to be at noon, from noon to 2. We will not have lunch, so if you want to run and grab something to eat before that, that'll be great. Also planned on um, April 14th, we're going to do the AED and uh, CPR class again to renew that. So those of you who went last year, um, please feel free to come again. It's a very opinionated microphone. It just does what it wants. Uh, no. No, it is. Oh, thank you so much. Oops, sorry. I'll hold it out here. First and foremost, I, I'm so excited to be back here. It's, I've had five surgeries, and but we're getting there. I have one more, but hopefully it won't be near what the others have been. I can't thank all of you enough for the wonderful, wonderful cards, the thoughts, the prayers, and everything that you give. Now, according for counsel, we are happy to welcome Paul Wessel and back in the back row, Lynette Erickson, as filling in. Thank you. Yeah, there. Bob was clapping. <laughs> Thanks. Bob was just excited that there was another fella, you know. <laughs> Um, just two things that are really, really important for us. We keep hearing about communication, communication, communication. And the council is going to make really, really 
200% effort to make sure that we get communications that are going on out to you in every form that we possibly can and we're hoping to eventually be available after service in order to ask, answer questions. Um, we did make a commitment um, and we are committed to making sure about that. We also are committed to using our committees. So from this point forward, the committees need to be making the decisions around um, what kind of things. So if it's a property type thing, it will go to the property committee. If it's you know finance, if it's the different ones. So please know that we are really trying to um, brush up on all of that and, and make it a much stronger thing. And thank you again. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who brings us out of captivity into freedom, out of the wilderness into the promised land, out of death into life. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. For self-centered living and for failing to walk with humility and gentleness, Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For longing for, to have what is not ours and for hearts that are not at rest within ourselves. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy For misuse of human relationships and for unwillingness to see the image of God in others. For jealousies that divide families and nations, and for rivalries that create strife and warfare. For reluctance in sharing the gifts of God, and for carelessness with the fruits of creation. For hurtful words that condemn and for angry deeds that harm. For idleness and witnessing to Jesus Christ and for squandering the gifts of love and grace. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for Christ's sake, God forgives us all our sins. Through the Holy Spirit, God cleanses us and gives us the power to proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called us out of darkness into the marvelous divine light. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ's and by Christ's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the one who creates, redeems, and sustains us. Amen. Please rise. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, by the passion of Jesus, your beloved, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of Jesus Christ, our brother and friend, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Our Old Testament reading for, to, for today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven or is on the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrong, wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness, witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Please read responsibly with me the Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day it tells to another and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language and their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into all the lands and their message to the ends of the world where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like lovers out of their rooms. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Most High is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of God is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The commandment of God is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Most High is clean and endures forever. The judgments of God are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter by far than honey. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not go into dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Our 
Our New Testament reading comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, beginning in chapter 1, verses 18. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, wisdom. but we proclaim, proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Please rise to welcome the gospel. to you, our Sovereign Jesus Christ. We proclaim Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Glory and praise to you, our Sovereign Jesus Christ. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, o God. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jewish leaders then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jewish leaders then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking the temple of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. It was a beautiful spring morning, and the man drove cheerfully along a gently winding road, the top of his convertible down so he could enjoy the outdoors. He noticed that the hills in front of him were green beneath the bright blue sky, and the wildflowers uh, had begun to grow along the side of the road. Suddenly, a car came around the curve in front of him, halfway into his lane, causing him to swerve and brake hard. As it passed, the driver yelled through her open window, Pig! Pig! The man felt rage swelling within him, and even though she knew he was long gone and couldn't hear him, he yelled a rather uncomplimentary response over his shoulder and followed it up with a hand gesture. Then, turning his eyes back to the road, he accelerated into the curve, and that's when he hit the pig. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> the man, um, well, let me just say there's no doubt that anger can cause us to act in ways we wouldn't usually act. We've seen it in others and we've seen it in ourselves. Sometimes we've even seen it at church. 
Unbridled anger can lead us to strike out and hurt those we love most. A lot of the time, we're angry at that over there, but we, uh, we aim our anger at people we love. Unbridled anger is destructive. It's dangerous, and it certainly isn't nice. We learn early not to lose control. We want everybody to be, you know, nice. We want everyone to get along. We certainly don't want to deal with angry outbursts that result in unpredictable and sometimes violent behavior. And especially, we expect everyone to be nice in church. Maybe that's why our gospel lesson is so disturbing. Um, and I want to say, biblical scholars are pretty certain that this event is the, the uh, watershed event that led to Jesus', Jesus execution. But the Jesus we're most likely to be comfortable with is meek and mild. He has a perfectly groomed beard and clean nails and a serene Northern European face. He has squeaky clean hair. You know, they didn't have showers back then. The Jesus we're likely to be comfortable with was born without a mess and lies without crying in a bed of sweet-smelling hay surrounded by cute, fluffy animals that smell just as sweet in a stable that never needs to be mucked out. But, you know, that's white Jesus, the Jesus of our culture. The Jesus we meet today in the fourth gospel is angry. Eyes flashing, he moves to the temple courtyard, kicking over tables heavy with coins, and drives the animals away with the noise of a whip. So how can we reconcile our understanding that it isn't nice to be angry with today's gospel lesson? In order to understand where the gospel writer is going with this story, we need to look past the descriptions we've learned from Christmas carols and Hallmark cards to what scripture actually tells us about Jesus' life and ministry. Mid-20th century author and playwright Dorothy Sayers wrote, the people who hanged Christ to do them justice never accused him of being a bore. On the contrary, they thought him too dynamic to be safe. It has been left to later generations to muffle up that shattering personality and surround him with an atmosphere of tedium. We have very efficiently paired the claws of the Lion of Judah, certified him meek and mild, and recommended him as a fitting household pet for pale curates and pious old ladies. To those who knew him, however, he in no way suggested a milk and water person. They objected to him as a dangerous firebrand. True, he was tender to the unfortunate, patient with honest inquirers, and humble before heaven. But he insulted respectable clergymen by calling them hypocrites. He referred to King Herod as that fox. He went to parties in disreputable company and was looked upon as a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. He assaulted indignant, indignant tradesmen and threw them and their belongings out of the temple. He drove a coach and horse through a number of sacred sacrosanct and hoary regulations. He cured diseases by any means that came handy with a shocking casualness in the matter of other people's pigs and property. He showed no proper deference for wealth and social position. When confronted with neat dialectical traps, he displayed a paradoxical human that affronted serious-minded people, and he retorted by asking disagreeably searching questions that could not be answered by rule of thumb. He was emphatically not a dull man in his human lifetime, and if he was God, there can be nothing dull about God either. But he had a daily beauty in his life that made us ugly, and official felt that the established order of things would be much more secure without him. So they did away with God in the name of peace and quietness. The Jesus of history is not the man whose image we see, see on paraphernalia sold in Bible bookstores or who looks down his patrician nose from so many famous paintings. 
the Jesus of history, taught that the greatest commandments were that we love God and our neighbor as ourselves. He insisted on a justice grounded in compassion. And the way John tells the story, that particular injustice being perpetrated in the temple courtyard was being perpetrated in God's name primarily against those of limited economic means. Oh dear, and I am missing some things. A New Testament scholar, William Barclay, tells how Jews from all over the known world would gather in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And each one was required to pay a temple tax. Now the temple tax had to be paid in Jewish coins. When you paid your Roman tax, it had to be paid in Roman coins. But the temple tax had to be paid in Jewish coins. Because Jewish travelers would arrive with coins from many countries. And because even the local currency was Roman, Money chamber changers would make a hefty profit exchanging foreign co coins for Jewish coins. Imagine, I mean, those of us who've traveled to foreign countries and had to exchange our currency at the airport know what price gouging looks like. That's why you exchange your money somewhere else first before you travel. In some cases, the fee was equal to an entire day's wages. Airport, uh, airport rates haven't gotten quite that bad yet. Others made a fortune selling anima, animals for sacrifice. Now, animal sacrifices were necessary for a Jew to be right with God, but you know, it's difficult to travel with animals. How many of you have gone on trips with your dogs in your car? Yeah. Well, imagine if you were walking. And, um, you, you know, that was before Bring Fido, where you look at Bring Fido on your phone to find out where there's uh, a dog-friendly lodging. Yeah, none of that. So they had the market cornered in Jerusalem. And so the animal merchants were able to charge exorbitant prices for the animals they sold. So a pair of doves uh, that outside the, the temple courtyard would be maybe a day's wages in the temple courtyard would cost 15 to 20 times that much. And not only that, but all those sacrificial animals were inspected to make sure that they were perfect and unblemished, unblemished, as scripture said. It was required by the law. But here's the thing. Who decides what's unblemished and perfect? Yeah. So the animals brought from the outside by the people who could manage to bring them were found to be imperfect and they had to buy animals there anyway. And for this, the inspectors also required a substantial fee. The wealthy had no difficulty paying for the required animals, but for people who were poor, coming up with fees was often impossible. Imp impossible to be right with God. Unable to afford what was necessary for reconciliation then, the marginalized were further separated from God and community. So it's no wonder Jesus was angry. The religious authorities were perpetrating the cycle of marginalizing and devaluating people. Devaluing people. And doing it in God's name in order to protect and advance their own power during the Roman occupation. So Jesus' anger was righteous anger. Righteous anger is a response to unjust injustice. Anger in and of itself is not evil. Anger is only evil when it's misused and misdirected and hurts people. It's only evil when it's unbridled and out of control. We get angry because angry, anger is a gift from God. It's a gift God has given us to use in God's service. Anger is an emotion that allows us to move past our fear and complacency in response to injustice. Now, uh, 
what I can't help thinking of, maybe like me when you were a little kid in grade school, you were uh, horrified by the idea that you would ever get sent to the principal. Or maybe you were one of the people who always got sent to the principal. Everybody has to be that kid. But the thing is, no one likes getting sent to the principal. It's just not fun. But then we grow up, and someone is mean to our kids, and something wrong is happening at school. And it's our righteous anger over the way our child is being treated that gets us past our fear of the principal's office to make that appointment and go talk to the principal about what's happening, right? That righteous anger gets us past our fear. If it weren't for righteous anger, which of us would have the energy or the courage to take on a government bureaucracy or a large corporation or to risk disapproval from family or friends? There's so many school shootings today that it's difficult to keep track of them all. But I particularly remember the Parkland School shooting in Florida six years ago. And I particularly remember the righteous anger that gave Stoneman Douglas High School students who survived the shooting the courage to stage a die-in and confront law lawmakers in their state capital about gun laws, and courage to move forward even in the face of death threats from extremists. Righteous anger is focused. Righteous anger allows a person or group of people to act with passion against the odds in response to injustice. It was the righteous anger of Americans of African descent that brought about the 14th Amendment. It was the righteous anger of same-sex couples that forced the U.S. Supreme Court to consider the constitutionality of same-sex marriage bans. It's the righteous anger of people of African descent that has brought police brutality into the light of day. And it's the righteous anger that allowed Jesus to challenge injustice in God's name. Jesus' righteous anger was directed against all forms of injustice, particularly against the so, those social values and policies that keep the marginalized away from God, that keep the marginalized from God's altar. And that raises the question, what are the ways in which we continue to keep the marginalized away from God's altar today? Have we put a price on God's grace? Is this house of God uh, open and accessible to all? We say everyone is welcome here, and my experience that everyone is welcome once they walk through the doors. How do we ensure that marginalized people know they're welcome here and would want to walk through the doors? What about this neighborhood and the, the surrounding community? How do we respond to injustice when we feel that righteous anger well up within us on behalf of ourselves or someone else? Do we use it constructively for the sake of our neighbor? Or do we beat it back down or just complain to our friends about what's going on because we believe it isn't nice to be angry. God has gifted us with the capacity for anger and we're to use that gift in God's service as we are all of our God's given God-given gifts. Any gift can be used in God's service or misused. Any gift the prophet Micah wrote, What is good has been explained to you. This is what God asks of you, only this, to act justly, to love tenderly, and to walk humbly with your God. This Lent, let's give up putting Christ in a cage and trying to tame him. Let's give up the notion that good people are always nice. 
Instead, let's acknowledge that injustice is always an affront to our God. Let's claim our righteous anger so that we can stand against injustice and for God's justice for the sake of the gospel. Please rise.
trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need, eating, ending each petition. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You alone are God. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest. Awaken the church to the mystery of your presence and give us glad hearts as we receive the good news of your deliverance. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You renew creation. Drive out those who would make the earth a marketplace. Protect rainforests, mountaintops, oceans, and wilderness areas from commercial exploitation. Unite nations, policymakers, and businesses in efforts to reduce carbon emissions. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You judge the nations. We pray for an end to war and strife in every land, especially Ukraine and the Holy Land. Strengthen international efforts to negotiate peace and provide humanitarian aid to people fleeing from conflict. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You bring healing and hope. We give thanks for physicians, nurses, researchers, therapists, and public health workers who prevent and treat illness. We pray for any who are sick, especially those we name now, out loud or in the silence of our heart. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You abide with your people. Sustain any in this community undergoing life transitions, marriage, divorce, childbirth, adoption, moving, graduation, employment change, or death in the family, especially those we name now. We pray for those preparing for baptism. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For what else do God's people pray? Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You bring life from death. We remember our loved ones who have died, confident that they have new life in you. May we trust that nothing can separate us from your love. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share a side of that peace with one another. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Lord. Oh. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Lord. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Paul. Peace be with you. 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 We continue our worship with our offerings.
please rise. Through Jesus Christ, our brother and friend. Amen. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the God of all. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who, sharing our life, lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to your own brilliant light. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember Christ's Passover from death to life. 
Christ have mercy on us all. Keep us steadfast ere we fall. Break the bread for the wine. Come and die. O oh God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us and send us forth burning with justice, peace, and love. Holy Spirit, breathe again. Light the darkness, be our friend. Break the bread, pour the wine, come and die. With Elsie and Doris and your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with the sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy trinity, now and forever. Gathered into one in the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We will receive Holy Communion at the front of the aisle, so please come at the direction of the ushers. You may receive either regular bread from me or uh, gluten-free bread from the assisting minister, and I have not touched it with my gluten-y hands. You may choose either a cup of purple grape juice or of a purple wine or gold grape juice. Um, Either is just fine. Return to God with all your heart. Receive bread for the journey. Drink for the desert. Absolutely everyone is welcome at God's table. Body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. 
God of compassion, we give you thanks for seating us at your table and serving us with the food of eternal life. We who once were dead are now living members of Christ, awakened by the breathing of your spirit. Send us out to awaken others to the mystery of your love, which is revealed to all the world in the one who came to give himself away, Jesus Christ, our brother and friend. Amen. Amen. I invite all the communion ministers forward and please join me on this side of the communion rail so you're all in one place. Eternal God, whose glory is revealed in the crucified and risen one, bless those who go forth to share your word and sacrament with our sisters and brothers who are sick, homebound, or imprisoned. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those to whom we bring this communion in the body and blood of Christ, that we may all feast on your abundant love made known in Jesus Christ our sovereign. Amen. Amen. God the Father bless you and shield you. Christ our Mother shelter you and carry you. God the Holy Spirit guide your journey both now and forever. Amen.